Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our DARIA session today, the Drug and Alcohol Research and Innovation Active Learning Network uh, on the 4th of July, 2020-2022. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm seated, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and pay my respects to elders of all the lands on which everyone is seated today as they're joining us today. I'm really happy today to, to uh, welcome uh, our presenter today, Chris Davis. Particularly happy because Chris has joined us at St Vincent's Hospital as a consultant recently and has, and has really been a great addition to the team and I'm really pleased that he's agreed to do this session for us today as well. He initially trained as a GP in London and developed a passion for helping people who drink alcohol and have problems related to it around 10 years ago and introduced a GP-led model of home withdrawal to Australia when he, he came here in 2014, the clean slate model. And then during the COVID period, he actually migrated this model, which was very successful, uh, onto a telehealth platform and set up the clean slate people to help people across the whole country to actually actually access home-based alcohol uh, withdrawal from the safety and comfort of their own home with, with supports virtually. And this is kind of an innovative model for, for us here in, in Australia. I know that some of the LHDs do something sim similar, but this is a this is kind of a whole package that people can access from uh, that may be distant from a metro centre and don't have ready access, ready access to, to those kind of supports. And I know that Chris spent quite a lot of time trying to support GPs and train GPs and encourage GPs to do this in, in primary care. And as we know, there are a lot of limitations to access to general practice that the funding mechanisms just don't support this kind of intervention in general practice in primary care. So I think this it will be really interesting to hear from Chris how this intervention kind of can fill one of the many gaps in our service provision around Australia. So over to you, Chris. Brilliant. Th thanks so much, Nadine. Um, and, and yeah, I guess um, in my passion really has been to help problem drinkers, but it has also now become um, reducing health inequalities uh, in, in Australia and breaking down the barriers to, to accessing uh, health services, but particularly addiction health services. Um, I'll start with just a very quick introduction into how the Clean State Clinic got started uh, and I'll talk to the problem as I see it uh, and then I'll, I'll go on and, and uh, show you the outcomes that I, I, I got from my GP-led clinics both in the UK uh, and, and in Australia um, before I talk a bit about how we then migrated the face-to-face -face program onto a telehealth platform. Uh, I'll talk then to the clinical model like how we actually uh, perform home alcohol detox over telehealth. I'll talk to the, the three-month outcome data that we've already got from the telehealth program. And then I'd also like to show you uh, very quickly uh, the resource page on, on the website that I've put together. I sort of joked with my patients for years that I, I wanted to put all my resources onto a web page so I didn't have to hand them the, the reams of A4 paper that I used to hand them. And now I can finally do that, which is great. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about what, what I see that the future of the Clean State Clinic and the future of telehealth in, in healthcare. Um, and then hopefully we'll have look, lots of time for some questions uh, at the end. So, yeah, I, I mean, as Nadine said, I, I, I did a diploma in, in um, substance misuse management in primary care, I think it was called, uh, about 12 years ago to become a methadone prescriber in my practice in London. But what I was really seeing uh, every day in my GP clinics were, were the problems with the alcohol were, were causing, uh, not just with people with high blood pressure and the, the physical uh, effects of alcohol, but, but also in how it was affecting their, their families, uh, their workmates, their children. Um, and, and around that time, I was going through a lot of personal stresses and was suffering with anxiety and had a binge uh, pattern of drinking myself, which I'd recognized was, was an unhealthy coping mechanism. So I think part of my interest was a, a journey to, to self-improvement as well. So I, I was prescribing methadone and in the borough of Wandsworth where I was working, we, we set up three uh, mainly nurse-led home alcohol detox clinics in an effort really to save the NHS money more than anything, our specialist services were overburdened, they had high, uh, high costs and long wait lists. So myself and, and a couple of GP colleagues uh, began these home alcohol withdrawal um, clinics. And very quickly, 
it was it became the most rewarding thing I'd ever done it in medicine to to see somebody in the throes of alcohol dependence with all of the problems that that causes to be able to say that that I can help the person rather than having to to refer them into a service to go on that journey with somebody and then see uh, see the difference that that made in a very short period of time to them and their families was hugely satisfying. And so when I emigrated here in, in 2014, I was determined to bring this model uh, with me. And, and, and it was no surprise that we have exactly the same problems here in Australia with, with access to specialist services. Um, so I came over in 2014 um, and set up, uh, I, I, I set up what I called then the Clean State Clinic. And I just had to adapt the NHS model to Medicare, which really meant that I had to see the patient every day during detox because there's no Medicare rebate for the nursing appointments. Uh, I had to streamline the assessment pack because it was taking my nurse an hour and a half to go through the heavy assessment pack I brought over from the NHS with me. So I designed it so that the patient could fill it out and bring it back in with them at their next appointment. Um, and then I audited my results, uh, which I'll, I'll show you show you now. So Chris, at the moment we can see your website. I don't know if you've got slides oh, for us as well. So yeah. sorry. Yeah. So sorry. just while Chris is bringing up his, his slides, just to remind people, if you've got some questions, you can put them in the Q&A box or, you, or if you've got comments, you can pop them in the chat box. Chris can't actually see those, so I'll, I'll be reading them out um, to Chris to remind him if, if he doesn't get to answering those questions. But please, far away as we're going along. Is that better? That's better. Thanks, Chris. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so since joining St Vincent's um, only a few weeks ago, I, I really feel like we're, we're at the pointy end of the stick here, you know, really seeing the tip of the iceberg and people who are really sick uh, or have severe dependency issues and, and uh, what I'd really you know, like uh, to, to prevent is, is, you know, people falling in the river higher up and, uh, and home alcohol detox really catches those mild to moderate dependents. Um, and I hopefully can prevent them from ever needing our inpatient services. I know I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, but alcohol is the most harmful drug uh, in Australia. Uh, an Australian dies every 90 minutes, costing us $15 billion a year. Um, what people might not realise is, is that most alcohol dependent people uh, can safely and successfully be detoxed in their own home and will have better outcomes if we can do that. Uh, there's good evidence now that detoxing in your own environment, in context where your triggers and stresses are, um, learning to deal with those um, from, from the outset um, means you've got a better chance uh, of uh, meeting your alcohol goals in the longer term. But we also know that it takes on average uh, 17 years for people with alcohol use disorder to ask for help. Uh, and the reasons for that are, are many, but, but stigma being one of the, the biggest ones and certainly uh, su suggesting someone goes to Alcoholics Anonymous or accesses a specialist service when you're in primary care, um, it can really put people off. And so to be able to, uh, I guess, offer a whole range of treatments is really important. Um, we think currently there's about 400,000 Australians who would benefit and, and indeed need uh, a home alcohol detox. And, and we reckon 100% more, 100%, 100,000 more dependent drinkers have emerged during COVID. We know that Australians are drinking 20 to 25% more alcohol than they were pre-COVID. And last year, alcohol-related deaths increased by 8.7%, 8, 8 I think it was, but more than 8%. Um, so I set up the face-to-face -face model in Blacktown, and um, this was the first year that I, I ran the clinic, and I saw 78 clients booked in for the Clean State Clinic, of which 50 of those filled out my assessment pack. Um, so the other 28 either just needed a brief intervention uh, or come to see me about other dependencies or addictions that they, they may have had. Of those 50 who filled out the assessment pack, only four of them needed a 41 of them needed a medicated detox, nine of which I had to refer to my colleagues at Napinion or, or Blacktown Hospital for an inpatient uh, detox, uh, and 32 completed a um, home detox through, through the service I was running. And, and these were the outcomes that, that I got from 
Black Town. I, I guess the the main one I, I want you to sort of look at is the three months post detox reduction in alcohol dependence, which is about 84%. And, and you'll see that that flows through uh, the outcomes from uh, the UK, because we've got some outcome data from before I came here, but also to, through to the three months uh, results we were getting with the, the telehealth service as well. Um, yeah, but uh, as you can see, the, the results are great. And, and this is because we have very well motivated um, clients who are treatment seeking, uh, and are, are in that mild to moderate bracket. Um, so again, the hope is that all of these clients uh, never need uh, our inpatient services. So in a weird twist of fate, where I was working in Wandsworth, uh, they have virtually the same population of Blacktown where I moved to. Uh, and uh, the, the real difference is we had three clinics. And so we had three times as many clients going through the detoxes in Wandsworth. Um, they had an abstinence rate at three months of, of 95%. Uh, and that was the outcome that they were measuring. Um, as you can see, our, our abstinence rate in Blacktown was about 66%. So, I mean, effectively, effectively the same. So I was loving doing this work and really trying to engage my GP colleagues in um, trying to take, take some of this work on. And, uh, and I, I, you know, the, 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 I estimated that just doing those detoxes at home in Blacktown saved the public purse $150,000. Like if, if those, all of those patients went into inpatient care, which was the, the current model, uh, yeah, it, it would have cost $150,000 more. And, and, and so I sort of took this audit to PHNs, to the local health district. I even sat on the Agency for Clinical Innovation Committee for a, a year trying to improve these primary care pathways into alcohol detox. Um, what worked in the NHS was a financial incentive to GPs, and, and they really didn't need much financial incentive to take this work on, but trying to get anyone to give GPs more money was, yeah, I was not, not going to get anywhere. So, so really, they offered me education, and I, I think education is essential in, in reducing stigma. Um, so I've been educating GPs through the, the Royal College's uh, Alcohol and Other Drug Education Program for the last couple of years. I've done some webinars for the PHNs, but GPs really didn't want to take on this work. It was seen as complex and time consuming and had no financial remuneration attached to it. You know, so uh, it was a hard sell. So then COVID hit and uh, Chris Rain, who's the founder of Hello Sunday Morning, uh, who, who I got to know through our shared passion. I'd done a little bit of work here and there uh, for Hello Sunday Mornings or doing some leaflets for them. And he, he approached me to say, you know, look, this problem's getting worse. Treatment centers are closing or are short staffed. You know, what's our plan? You know, and my plan was always to get more GPs doing this work, but I hadn't really got anywhere. So he said, why don't we put it onto telehealth? Um, and as soon as he said that, you know, uh, yeah, with this sort of beast was created. Um, Pia Clinton Tarras, that is our CEO. She's also a, a really good old friend of mine who, who I knew from London. And uh, she's a health economist and health strategist who was working at Deloitte and had uh, become uh, dependent upon alcohol herself through the stresses uh, at Deloitte. And uh, she actually was the first client to go through the telehealth um, program as part of our sort of friends and family test. Um, I'm pleased to say she, she's done amazingly well and is now reaching and sort of meeting her alcohol goals. So all three of us um, have lived experience and, and really were very passionate about this project that we were about to, to embark on. And we knew we had a chance to design a, uh, a model or a service from scratch um, ourselves. Um, so we invested our own money and a lot of our, our own time into it. And, and we really wanted to set, um, set some high standards for ourselves. And our, I guess our vision, really, uh, if we could have a wish, it would be that every Australian had access to healthcare without any barriers. And, and that's sort of what we're, we're looking towards. Um, and, and these were our sort of list of, of uh, values that we wanted to, to sort of to, to achieve. We knew that um, with this sort of 
anything to do with addictions or, or mental health, we really needed that human touch and that therapeutic um, alliance. And so continuity of care in our services is essential. But we also knew that technology could enable us to provide the service uh, in, in a much more efficient and streamlined way. We wanted it to be doctor-led, um, ease of access, of course, we, we understood the importance of discretion and confidentiality. And, and, and that was the, the real benefit of my GP program was that people could just go to their GP, have a, have a home detox and no one would have to know. You know and, and this service offers that same level of, of discretion. We send out a vitamin package and uh, a breathalyzer to all of our clients, which we call our, our care package. So again, you know, rather than me saying, please go out and buy thiamine, I'm saying, here it is, it's delivered to your door. So that sort of makes things a little easier, breaks down that little barrier. We also are fully aware that a detox is not a cure and, and, and that it really is just one of the steps on the road to recovery. And so we wanted to build in a 12 month uh, follow up package and aftercare, of course, is something that we start talking about uh, at first assessment. Um, as a GP myself, I knew that GP engagement again is essential for the care of the patient. Um, we, we will have these patients for one of their issues for a snap for a snapshot in time. So we write to the GP uh, straight away as soon as they engage with us with consent of the, the client. Uh, we write to the GP pre-detox, post-detox, um, and at the end of the 12 months. I even fill out a GP management plan, uh, a suggested GP management plan that the GP themselves can then bill to Medicare. So we don't bill Medicare anything. Um, I'll talk about how we're funded a, a little bit later on. But so the GP themselves can get the big ticket item, the 721723, and hopefully that gets a little bit of buy-in from them as well. Um, so yeah, GP education, again, is one of a real big mission of mine. So there's a big GP educational um, part of our, our website, um, but also in the letters that we write to our GPs, encouraging them um, to prescribe anti-craving medications, for example. Uh, I'm always chatting to the GPs and uh, we've done some webinars. We have a series of webinars that, that we do in the next ones um, in a couple of weeks time uh, for our GP colleagues. Um, so that's our vision and, and you know our, our vision may not be uh realistic although it's a, an ultimate goal but um we we have a mission which we believe is is more realistic uh which is really to improve the health and wellness of individuals struggling with addiction and to make withdrawal and recovery services accessible to more people who need them which we feel is a little bit more realistic um uh, Pia is a health strategist for Deloitte, and so uh, this is all, all, all language that I'm learning, but I, I, I'm really relishing it. So we certainly want to make a client impact. We want the client experience to be as, as good as possible. Um, and, and we can see from our feedback that we, our feedback has been really positive. And I think that is because of those reasons I mentioned. Certainly the continuity of care is something that they really value. Um, Chris Rain is really ambitious and he wants us to uh, detox 10,000 Australians, which, which sounds like a huge number, but um, when there's 400,000 we estimate needing a detox, actually, um, that still is just a small number. Um, the research impact is really important. I, again, this has to be uh, guideline driven and evidence based. It's a very medical model. And we're very lucky in that the University of Sydney, uh, Paul Haber and Kristen Morley are uh, evaluating our, our results. So by December, we should have 12 month outcomes. And hopefully we will have um, proven that this is uh, this is a feasible mode, uh, a feasible model of, of home detox. But we are a for purpose company. Um, we are really driven by uh, making a, a social impact. Uh, and so our, our, real, um, our real goal is to service those vulnerable, hard to reach populations. Um, we've, we've just hired our first uh, female Indigenous GP and we're working with the PHNs in, in Western Queensland and, and Western New South Wales um, to really make this culturally sensitive um, and uh, yeah, to be able to access communities uh, that, that otherwise wouldn't be able to 
have treatment is, is a huge goal for us and very exciting. And this is the sort of story so far. Um, 2015 is when the face to face model launched, and then 2020 is when Chris Rain called me and with the telehealth idea. By January last year, um, we'd hired uh, the one and only Lucy Scopoletti, who's a brilliant CNC here at St. Vincent's, uh, and, and Jenny Ryan, um, another fantastic nurse, with lots of experience in, in indigenous communities out in Inverell and um, doing this sort of work. We were super lucky to get the support of CESPAN and uh, Coordinaire and North Sydney PHNs who funded our, our proof of concept, without which we never would have got this off the ground. Um, and they've helped fund the evaluation that the University of Sydney is doing for us as well. And by October, our first 50 clients had commenced treatment. So this is the model. And the model is very similar. It will be familiar to most of you, very similar to what I was doing face to face, except it's technology enabled. So our clients um, either were being referred by our GPs, but, but really the easiest way is for them to self-refer via the website by filling out a suitability test, which is really just uh, our inclusion and exclusion criteria in a, in a quick test. Um, so our inclusion criteria is anybody who's motivated to change their relationship with alcohol between the ages of 18 and, and 80. And again, those ages can be flexible. Uh, exclusion really uh, is a history of withdrawal seizures or DTs um, or, or anything else that's too complex to be done at home. So uh, mainly that would be if there is violence in the home or no safe place to, to be detoxed, uh, lack of support person where that is essential. Um, and we, we can detox people without that support person as long as we've got other risk stratification in place. Um, other codependencies, complex uh, mental or, or physical health issues. But as I say, that only really accounts for about 10% of our uh, dependent drinkers. They fill out their suitability test. They then get um, a first assessment uh, with our nurse. Um, prior to that, we will email them the uh, assessment pack, uh, which has an audit questionnaire, severity of alcohol dependence questionnaire, uh, suicide risk assessment, our nutrition risk assessment, uh, family violence risk assessment, um, and some general questions. So the nurse has all that information by the time they, they do the first assessment. And as soon as they enroll, they start getting drink diaries emailed to them on a daily basis which again is a great motivational tool, starts to help work out what their triggers are uh, and gives us great information as well. The first assessment is really um, an introduction, rapport building and information gathering. We then ask them to do a blood test and a, a random your drug screen for us, fill out their drink diaries and we uh, signpost them to some resources on our website. Um, we do and the motivational interviewing starts. Second assessment, we meet with the support person, uh, ideally, um, and, and make sure we've ticked all our boxes with the, the blood tests are all back and that sort of thing. We've, they've already got their care package, so they've started on thiamine that gets sent out after the first assessment and they started playing around with their pocket breathalyzer. And that's when they'll see myself or one of my uh, specialist or GP colleagues. And, and really, our work is pretty easy. Uh, we value add where we can and do a prescription for the Valium. We come up with a, a medication regime, which is, is, is um, symptom led, um, which is, I guess, a point of difference from a lot of um, ambulatory detoxes. But we, we can be symptom led because we have a nurse um, assessment every day. Oh, I'll come on to that. Um, yeah, so during the detox, uh, the client will check in with the nurse in the morning, do a breathalyzer for us, uh, a CEWA score, and the drink diaries stop, obviously, and we have a detox diary that they get emailed every day, which has a, a SOARS questionnaire, a short alcohol withdrawal uh, score questionnaire. So they can do their own CEWA scale, really, and on there it, it can direct them whether they need to take an extra Valium dose or not. Um, they see the pharmacist face to face, ideally every day. We'll do their blood pressure for us. Um, and again, it's, uh, this is we've got a whole week then to start or to continue planning their aftercare. The end of the detox, myself or, or one of my 
colleagues will, will see the patient, see how they've gone. Um, again, we'll do our GP letters pre and post detox, and we'll um, prescribe anti-craving medications uh, as we see, um, uh, you know, whatever they, whatever we think is best for them to, to be prescribed. Um, and then we write to the GP to say what we've prescribed, why uh, we've prescribed them. Um, and then the follow-up carries on for, for 12 months. The nurse will check in weekly for the first month and then monthly for the first quarter, then quarterly after that. Um, and again, one of the beauty, beautiful things of this being tech enabled is that it's so easy for us to catch uh, brilliant data. Uh, we, we weren't so good at first. We weren't getting those one month outcomes and, and we weren't sure why because we were sending out the emails, but now we've just built it in that they, can, they can't actually go on and have their appointment until they've done a very quick audit in K10 questionnaire for us. So um, yeah, so now we're catching, catching really good data. So we can get um, great demographic information, um, which is pretty interesting depending on um, what you're interested in, in looking at. Uh, and then we get some really good baseline characteristics as well. Um, what was really interesting was actually how much our clients were spending because they're, they're filling out their drink diaries and telling us exactly how much they're spending, well, an approximate amount of how much they're spending every day. Uh, the average monthly spend was $910 a week. The 12 month program is $3,000. So all they have to do is stay absent for, for three months and they've already made their, their money back. So these are our outcomes uh, at last count, and we should have um, good 12 month uh, outcomes by December. We're not an abstinence based program, so we didn't feel like it was a fair um, measure to, to measure abstinence like I did in my face to face clinics. However, um, alcohol goals, I mean, we always encourage our clients to have a, a three month uh, complete abstinence break. Um, and so that, um, and most clients sign up to that. So meeting alcohol goals uh, generally means abstinence or near abstinence. Uh, reduced alcohol dependence will be, well, no, I'm not, not quite meeting my goals, but they haven't really met the criteria for a lapse or a relapse. And we have, uh, we have lapse and relapse pathways that the clients will then follow if, if that happens. Um, what was really interesting when we were um, talking to private health insurers about these uh, early outcomes was that Bupa, um, who, who have now signed a contract with us to deliver this for them, for 50 of their clients in, in Queensland, their, not, not just their relapse rate, but their one month readmission rate. So their current, uh, uh, their current pathway was to a three week inpatient private detox and rehab, their one month readmission rate was 28%. So you can see, you know, our, our, our relapse rate at three months is 10%, theirs at 1% was 28%. So again, this is a hugely cost effective uh, model for, for private health insurers as well, should they, should they want to follow suit. The clients really, uh, we haven't had any complaints. Um, the the only reason we didn't score a zero on the I experienced unexpected harm or distress as a result of my care, that's all fifth bar down, was because one client um, was upset that he wasn't aware of the risk of seizures or DTs and, and he, he was a heavy drinker. And, and he said that caused a lot of anxiety sort of facing the fact and being told that he was at risk of these serious complications. And so that was an unexpected distress. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the outcomes are, are fantastic. Uh, and this is just some of the, the feedback comments that, that they've given us. Um, you know, and, and I think for, for Pia particularly, who's been working in, in public hospitals and, and private hospitals during her work at, as, as Deloitte, she said that, yeah, I mean, this is, it's, it's unusual to see um, such good, good feedback. Um, so, uh, what I think uh, the, 
the one thing which I think would be useful for pretty much everybody who, who is watching or listening to this presentation it is uh, is the website and the resource part uh, resource page of our website. As I say, I've, I've been helping people uh, through Home Detox for over 10 years. And so I have sort of gathered resources that I like and, and I just have, had to keep printing off all these pages. And to now have this all in one place is really exciting for me. So we've got a resource page for the patients, uh, for the support people, uh, a resource page for GPs. Um, and it's completely free for, for anybody to use. Um, I'll just just stop the share and hopefully I do this correctly. Uh, can you see the website now? Yes, we can. Um, so it's just cleanslateclinic.com. Uh, and if you, um, a lot of it is just information about the telehealth service, but if you go to the resource tab, and click on patient resources. There is uh, a first page of external resources. Um, so there's links to uh, podcasts and blogs. Uh, there's some free online counseling, uh, not, not run by us. Uh, there's sort of examples of phone apps, which I think are good, including Daybreak, which I think is excellent, which is how I sort of got involved with, with Chris Rain initially. Uh, Recovery Elevator's got some great podcasts. There's some uh, sobriety clocks and counters. Uh, I Am Sober, I think, is probably the best example of, of, of that. Um, then what I particularly like uh, is uh, the, the link to the TED Talks. There's a lot of um, not so good TED Talks out there. Um, oh, this is restricted because we're at Vinnie's, but you can actually just click on the link and it will play. So that's sort of an easy win from, from most patients. It's just 10 minutes out of their, out of their day. And I, and I think they really offer value. Um, we've got some website links. Uh, Sober in the Country have been a really important partner for us. Uh, through Sober in the Country, which is run by Shanna Wan, who, who recently became an Australian uh, local hero of the year. Uh, through them, we've been getting a lot of referrals and, and building a network in regional and remote Australia. And that's really been very, very exciting. And, and with their help, we won a, a philanthropic grant of $150,000 from the Snow Foundation, so that for those people who, who can't afford to pay, which is a lot of our clients, um, they can access the service for, for free or with a small co-payment. Uh, this Naked Mind I, I refer a lot of people to, I think it's excellent. They do a, a free 30-day uh, sort of outpatient program, if you like, just through email and video links, um, and then a few more, uh, through a few more pages there. Um, and again, there's there's so much so many resources out there. I think to have them all listed in one place is really helpful. Um, again, there's some books which I think think are good. Um, but so they're the external resources. We also have just some resources depending on where the client is in their their journey. So we've got some preparation resources talking about the importance of thiamine, writing a pros and cons list, some brief intervention stuff and self-management work. Uh, we've got a link to that short alcohol withdrawal score I was talking about that they get emailed to them. Um, they can't find that email, it's on the website. Uh, craving control leaflet that, that I've lifted from Turning Point, which I think is excellent. And so the support person information is there too. And then we also have the um, uh, some relapse prevention um, work and some leaflets about the anti-craving medications in that page. Um, there's the, the role of the support person, again, is so key. Um, and again, the role of the support person is a large part um, is in yeah is a large part of why home detox is often more successful than inpatient detox because they feel involved that they have a role which which they do um, but we can also reach out and, and help them um, as well and, and, and signpost them to, to some excellent external resources um, and again turning point to a brilliant 
friends and family program called, called Breakthrough that I refer a lot of people to. Uh, and again, some more support person resources there. Uh, and then there's our GP educational material as well. So uh, there's a couple of um, webinars that we've done from the Clean Slate Clinic team. There's the wonderful Lucy uh, and Hester Wilson who works with us uh, and some webinars for the GPs and a link to the latest alcohol treatment guidelines as well. Okay, so now try and put you back to the presentation. Um, so, this is where we think we can go next. We've already detoxed 100 people from alcohol and we've just enrolled our first client into our uh, stimulant pathway. Uh, we're also looking to, well, we have already designed a cannabis pathway, which, you know, this, this model really lends itself very, very well to. Uh, we're really trying to grow our, our public and, and private footprint uh, in Australia, but particularly in those remote and regional areas. And, and certainly we've been very lucky that uh, Western New South Wales and Western Queensland PHNs have funded us um, uh, on, on an ongoing basis, well, certainly for the next two years. Uh, and we've signed that contract with Bupa as well, and we have some philanthropic funding. So, you know, our goal really is to uh, break down the barriers of, of geography, but, but also uh, of finance. We don't really want anyone who, who can't afford to pay for this service not be able to access it. Um, by December, as I say, we should uh, have our uh, evaluation completed. And then in five years time, I hope to have met Chris Rain's goal of detoxing 10,000 people. Um, that's it for the slides, you'll be pleased to know. Um, please, this is a really uh, a, a huge passion of mine and, and I love talking to people about it. And um, so call me, that's my personal mobile number. I'm happy for you to use it. Uh, of course, email me, um, refer people in. If, you, if you're interested, you know, we're a very small company, so we can move really quickly, which is fantastic. So if you've got any ideas how you can use telehealth um, in your own services, I'm happy to just give advice or, or yeah, um, I'm here as a resource. So please, please use me. Th thanks, Chris. I guess, um, I mean, it was obvious from your presentation, but I guess I just want to state it again that um, Chris works part time for St Vincent's, as does Lucinda, the um, nurse practitioner who you mentioned before, and this work they do in their private capacity. Uh, and we're by no means endorsing or not this particular service, but we think it's a really interesting model for us to hear about. So so thanks, Chris, for, for presenting to us. I have so many questions. Um, I'm not going to ask them all, but given that uh, I'll just jump in. If other people want to send through questions, please send them through. But I've got a, a few other questions I'd like to ask. And I, I guess some of them, perhaps we could invite Paul Haber and, and Kirsten Wally to, to, to present next year on the evaluation so we can hear a bit more about some of those outcomes, which look pretty interesting to me. Um, I, I guess my, my nerdy question is how you, you say that people's dependence has improved. How do you measure that? Is that just the audit that you're using to, to measure that? Or do you use another measure for, for dependence severity? Yeah, so really just the audit and, and clinical review. So it's all, um, it's self-assessed. Um, when we brought the um, project to Paul Haber, he introduced the PET test. So we have been doing a, a PET test at one month. Do you want um, to just explain the PET test to, to people who might not have heard of it? Uh, I'm, <laughs> it stands for a much longer word than PET, so they've shortened it to PET. Uh, and PET is, <laughs> it's a test really, it's like the CDT test, but apparently uh, it's a bit more sensitive. So, so it's a blood it's test? Bit, it's a blood test, yeah, which uh, is, is, as far as we know, the most sensitive and specific test that can tell us whether how much or whether someone has actually had a drink in the last four weeks. I think you can only get it from, from RPA, costs about $150. 
Um, so, so we have included that in the evaluation. How many of our um, clients will have actually undergone that PEF test? I'm not sure. It's been quite hard to get. And the, the samples have been sent back from RPA because they've come from all over the country. You know, we've detoxed people in every state now and they're getting blood samples from Northern Territory and just sending them back. Um, so, yeah, let, let's see. Okay. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm curious, I guess I was surprised that your, your mean audit score at baseline was 24. Um, have you had any complications that have been of concern in that week that people are being monitored? Um, so uh, the patient selection process is pretty vigorous. Um, so they have the two uh, assessments, the assessment pack, all new patients are discussed in a clinic in our weekly clinical review meeting. Um, so we, we are uh, we're probably stricter. Well, we're certainly stricter than I was during doing my face to face clinic because we know we've got the tyranny of distance and, and not being able to see people face to face. Um, we have had, we've sent one person to hospital with a sort of unresolving tachycardia, which really was just put down to withdrawal. He just spent one night in hospital and carried on his detox with us. Um, we found out that uh, when I did my post detox review with one client that she had continued drinking two glasses of wine throughout the detox week and just neglected to tell us. Um, and, and yeah, we, we had one client who indeed was was jaundiced on his first assessment, um, who, who we couldn't then you know do a home detox. But but again, you know, I see that as a win because um, we were able to send him into hospital. Um, mm -hmm. which, you know, I, I think if I was reading correctly, that most people drinking seven to nine standard drinks on four days or so is that that right for the no, I think the audit questionnaire only asks you if you drink on four or more days a week. Mm. So our, our classic typical client is drinking one to two bottles of wine uh, a night with wine being the most you know, common, common drink that they're drinking. Mm. So, you know, people who do need a detox, but, but don't need an inpatient detox. Yeah. And, and they're the people who really are, have been falling through the cracks. They're the people mm. I've been seeing in GP land. People who need inpatient detox, you know, they tend to end up sick or in ED and they get their detox. Um, but it's, it's that sort of mild to moderate um, group of drinkers who I feel are, are underserviced um, by, by, by mm. us. So I noticed in your initial slide, you, you, you were saying that the aim is to, that the success rates are comparable um, to international success rates. I guess, how do you define success and then how do you benchmark it? I mean, I couldn't tell you what, if you ask me, what would I expect, ex expect success to be? Is it just, is it a self-reported measure or is what, how do you define success and what's the benchmark? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we haven't been able to find any um, any comparators, which was why it was fascinating to hear that 28% readmission rate at one month from Bupa. Um, I, I tried to get comparators when I did the audit at Blacktown and I presented that at the IMIA and, and the GP, GP17 conferences. I was desperate to get something to compare them to from, from inpatient services, but they uh, you know, those outcome data just don't exist in the literature, which is really nice that we can get 12 month outcome data from the telehealth service. And, you know, I, honestly, I, I so when I was doing this as a GP, I saw success as engagement in treatment, really. Um, you know, if someone is, is asking for help and, and getting it, I think that's I think that's that's a win because people ask for help and don't often get it. So mm. many patients would come to me saying, "I told my GP that I was drinking a bottle of wine at night and I wanted help because I couldn't stop." And and they're probably you know they didn't feel listened to, they didn't feel heard, they just would you know. And, and so um, I think the fact that people are drinking less is amazing, but but I you know I think the fact that they're engaged in treatment. Um, is probably how I would rate success. Mm -hmm. And do you expect people to stick around for the year or is that bit kind of optional in, in the package? Interestingly, um, the people who have dropped out, so people really like the support from the person who went through the detox with them, so Lucy or, or Jenny. Um, so most people have 
are, are accessing that support. The people who've dropped out really are those who've, who've relapsed. Um, and, and we can be assertive, which is really nice. We have their email address, we have their phone number. Um, and, 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 and I think that's uh, one of the advantages of us being tech, tech enabled is that you know, we, can really, we can get into their in email inbox and, and we can send them text. I mean, I know we can do that as, uh, from the hospital. So. And they can send for that at the, at the get-go, do they? Absolutely. Yeah. So in their assessment pack, they've got a list of things that they can send to, including contacting their GP, use of their anonymized data, um, contact details, contacting their support person. Um, and we haven't had many problems with that. People will often not consent us to speak to their GP. But then when we explain why that's important to us, they either do consent or they find another GP in their locale. <laughs> I, I mean, that's the problem with the, the regions is that yeah. they'll have one GP in their town um, who's been their GP forever. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we're facing that problem now where we've got a client who works in the town's GP surgery uh, and is friends with the GP and really doesn't want us to contact them. Um, and again, we've just got, got to sort of try and stratify that risk and, and work around that because we don't want to deny anyone care for, for that reason. Mm. And, and you've been going now since October. Have you had anyone coming back for a second go? Uh, we are, so we've had, uh, yes, is the short answer. We've had um, uh, at least one that I can think of who is, is, we've had one who's actually rejoined the full 12 month program. So she was a private paying client who, who we lost contact with uh, after about a month. And she's actually repaid to restart the program in full. And we've had a couple of lapses who've just sort of gone into our, our sort of lapse pathway um, where uh, we've either just done a, a very quick mini detox um, or we've just given them some extra support to get them back on track. Okay. And I'm interested to hear that you started the stimulant pathway. What do you offer in that given that there is no evidence for, for withdrawal? Yeah, so again, it's it's just it's very similar in that we it's sort of intense. Um, you know, it's the daily check-ins, it's that psychosocial report, um, it's that uh, that signposting, and, and we use a little bit of, of Valium or um, Alantapine if the specialist deems it to be useful. Um, and and again, we can give very small so, you know, scripts with very small quantities on them uh, again there's a there's a daily check-in and, and then there's a 12-month follow-up um, so it's sort of less medication heavy and, and more uh, psychosocial heavy we've got a we have a psychologist attached to us who we can offer three sessions of, of sort of first aid psychology uh, to people who don't already have a psychologist uh, and we've just employed a um, or we're not employed, that's the wrong word, but we've just sort of enlisted a psychotherapist as well that we can, we can signpost to who's got a lot of experience in, in the addiction field. But really that sort of support and signposting. Um, I won't disturb you with the rest of my long, long list. <laughs> um, I can't see any other questions from any of our friends online or any of our other panelists so we might just thank you for your time and um do you will the that website is up there on on the screen there and i do i do um remind people that, that there are a number of resources there that people can find useful with their their clients as well potentially and there's a comment here from rob page to say it was very impressive thanks chris thank <laughs> so thanks Chris, and have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Nadine. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Chris. It's just Lucy. Hi. Um, I'm just going to stop recording. Um, I'm just going to send you a quick email after this as well, just to check something with you. But thank you.